Kip, what's going on, man? What do you think of the new uh, the new temporary studio? <laughs> it's good. It'll work. Once a year. It's a white room. It's yep. got some cool flags behind us. These chairs are a little high, though. It is a little high. Maybe we a little too learn. much leg. This but. is. Did you know this is the first one that we're doing? Vi- no, no, no. We. I guess we did the uh, the video in Maine too. Well, we've done those Skype videos. Yeah, but those don't count. Oh, okay. Yes. Yeah. I mean, you were you were on your end in Salt Lake or whatever, and a I was little on my split end. screen action. Yeah. yeah, but I I do like uh, I do like doing them face to face, and it seems like this is becoming more common. Yeah. When are you gonna move to Maine? <laughs> we're gonna get you out here before before well, long. Once the cost of travel becomes too high, we're like, all right, Let's it justifies just, just moving. <laughs> That's right. Well, guys, like uh, like we had just mentioned, we're here in Maine again for. Is this the second week in a row, or we had a one-week break, right? There was a one-week break. One-week break. We're yep. here at, uh, at Origins Immersion Camp. Uh, of course, Pete Roberts, Brian Littlefield, the whole Origin team are out. Uh, a good percentage of the Echelon Front team are here. Have you rolled with any of those guys yet? Not yet. I'm going to roll with JP this afternoon, I think. I'd roll with JP. I think I can take him. I don't know, man. Everyone keeps saying, hey, you need to roll with Echo. He's a brown belt. Yeah, but, but I think Echo's injured beast. too, and I, I think he's injured. Oh, I haven't seen him with a gi on or anything, so oh, I'm I, assuming he's injured. I saw him this afternoon. Injured. Really? He's a beast too. Yeah. That guy is insane. Yeah, I can turtle up really well and just kind of protect myself. <laughs> <laughs> what about Jocko? Are you going to roll with Jocko? I would in a second. Yeah. Yeah, I think, I think take fun. advantage of that out here. Yeah. I think we're actually going to shoot bows a little bit later, so It's just fun. one of those things, right? You're like, you don't want to be the guy that's like this fanboy that's like, hey, can I roll with you? You know what I mean? Like, I, I don't want to be annoying. Yeah. You know what I mean? Well, so, I mean, you naturally go that way anyway, so, like, yeah. you're naturally annoying anyway. So. Yeah. So, I don't want to be extra annoying. Extra annoying. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, I bet he gets that a lot. Totally. Do you think guys like that get, like, I don't know what the term would be, but, like, headhunters? Not headhunters, but, like... Like a stalker, kind of? No, like... What do you mean? Like, I'm, I'm going to prove myself by beating you. Totally. Yeah. Totally. Yeah, because... I think guys do it by default, right? right? It's like, oh, it's an upper, I'm rolling with an upper belt. Like, this is where I'm going to measure myself. Right. So for sure, these guys. And I don't think there's anything wrong inherently with like figuring out how you stack up. Like even, even you and I rolled yesterday a little bit and it felt good. I mean, you still throttled me, but it felt better than last year. Yeah. Yeah. So it's not like I'm, I'm defining myself or identifying with me being better than you or not better, better than I was last year, but it also is a, um, it's market a, improvement, right? Yeah. I, I think it's when that's coupled with, um, maybe almost like from the perspective of like being too eager or too aggressive, mm-hmm. that's when it would get old. Right. Yeah. Like I could imagine that Jocko's like, this guy's just not training to see how he trains, but he's training to like to prove something. That's um, like a different mentality. Yeah. Definitely. I think if you're trying to prove something that's different, cause yeah. you're going to roll more aggressive. There's going to be some probably anger, flowing through your veins and then that's probably when Jocko yeah, just smashes and then he just you. Dominates yeah, you. and just kills you. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Puts well, you in place. Yeah. Well that's what we're here doing. You know, we're here checking it out. Um, we came last year of course and again for the second year in a row. This is your second year, right? Yeah. You haven't second come before year. Nope. this at all? No. Nope. Uh so yeah, we're here with Origin, the Echelon front team, another I don't know, I think there's like two hundred guys in session A or three hundred guys in session A and another three hundred guys in session B. So there's like six hundred people rolling through here. Yeah. And I think there's more uh upper belts this year than it seemed last year. Is that right? Yeah, that mat with all the black and browns is is almost too small. Really? Yeah. Once we start going over instruction, like there's barely yeah. space on there. So that's yeah. a good sign. They put us lowly white belts in another building and it's super hot in there. And <laughs> Close the doors. Close the doors. Yeah. We're like, there you go. <laughs> Peons. You got to earn your way out of yeah, here. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. So next year I'm going to be yeah. out of there. I'm You're like, be- I'm out of here. No, no, no. You got to prove yourself first. I'm going to be with the blue belts next year. Love it. It's my commitment right now. Yeah. All right. Should we get into it enough wasting yeah, time? For uh, sure. I mean, most of the guys are listening. They, they've listened to us before. They know what we're yapping about. But if you're listening for the very first time, this is an Ask Me Anything. So I think we got a lot of questions from the Facebook group today. Yep. And we a may few have from a Iron Council. From Iron Council. Yep. Uh, so what we'll do, guys, is we'll take, I don't know, another 45, 50 minutes or so and field some of these questions, do our best we can to answer those questions. And, uh, and if we can't, we'll make something up. Yeah. We're good at that. <laughs> Most of what we do yeah. seems like we're making stuff. But up regardless, there. anything we say is correct and accurate. That's right. So, so don't question. There you it. go. <laughs> don't com- don't bitch. All right. What's number one? You're gonna right. work on your swearing. Oh, man. that's true. Yeah. One day, you and I are gonna be able to mark 
this podcast has asked me anything without having to mark it as explicit. Explicit, yeah. If you would just clean it up a little bit, we'd be able to do that, and the kids could start listening. Well, and I love the fact that one of the guys someone called you, yeah, out. someone called us out, and he's like, <laughs> "No, not us, you." Yeah, okay. He called me out, but it was funny because he was like, uh, "Yeah, when you guys can stop swearing." <laughs> I was like, "Jeez, okay, <laughs> pretty funny." Yeah. Apparently, it's a problem. All right. Yeah. Um, yeah, our first question is by Mr. Bubba Downs. Um, and I think Bubba's asking this really from a personal perspective, because as you know, Bubba's uh, been training jujitsu. He's yeah, getting he into it, right? And yeah. so he's saying, what are some good moves when rolling with a guy that is roughly 80 to 100 pounds um, over you? So a bigger guy. So he's, I think he's looking for some good moves when rolling with big guys. And maybe, maybe the way we answer this question is really from, I don't know, maybe what are go-to submissions or positions maybe that uh, well, I can tell you, you like, to. like my perspective is <clears throat> with a big guy like that, especially yours, your answer is going to be different than mine because of where we are in our journey. Yeah. Uh, for me, it would just be to stay alive and manage distance. So I don't have to full that, feel that full weight. Yeah. I mean, that's really what it would be for me. It's yeah. like more don't from a survival bottom, side, survive, yeah. try to get out from being on the bottom, try to manage the distance so you can leverage a little better working limbs and things like that rather than body because a guy that's 80 to 100 pounds heavier than me is just going to smash totally. especially if he's uh just getting into jujitsu and he knows he's big and he knows he's got some some weight behind him yeah he's just going to hulk smash the whole time <laughs> like he's not going to use technique yeah so for me it would be survival again because i'm just getting started on the journey it would be survival and then it would be managing distance and positions and trying to keep myself from being on the bottom. Yeah, I totally agree. I think there's an element of survival with any guy that's substantially bigger than you. Yeah. And then your attacks, I think, will vary as well. Like if I think specifically of, of a really, he wasn't like a big, big guy, but really strong guy. Yeah. Um, Kent, I used to train, he now moved to Florida, but he used to train with us at Unified. And what I learned with him is I would stop attacking limbs. Actually, mm. it was back and choke only. Oh yeah. I, arms wasn't because he's was, just so he, strong. He's just so strong. Yeah. yeah. Like I wasn't getting enough leverage or he'd use that to stack me and then come up on top. And so True. I, I think it's staying off the bottom, try to play your top game as much as possible. So that weight's not on you. And then I'd say chokes yeah just go for the the blood chokes not the limbs yeah yeah that makes sense because those guys are they're, they're going to be really strong so it's going to be harder to get those submissions i, I want to say impossible though because right. let's clarify like that's the objective of jiu-jitsu right. is that, leverage that a smaller guy should be able to catch right right but it is harder when they're really strong especially if like Bubba, he's just getting started like i am uh, i would also say that there's a difference between body types of course for guys that are 80 to 100 pounds heavier than you, there's a guy who may be fat. Yeah. And, and he's going to tire. Yeah. You know, we talked gas. about this yesterday, right? It's yeah. like weather the storm right. is your objective. All you yeah. have to do is wait 60 <laughs> seconds and then he's just going to lay on you and you can, <laughs> you can sweep him or slide out from underneath shrimp and get away from him. And he's done. He's exhausted. Yeah. And then there's like these big body barrel chested wrestler types who they're just strong. They're not going to gas and they just, they know how to use their weight effectively, their muscle effectively. Yeah. And I think that's probably more of what we're talking about. Totally. That guy. Totally. And, I, and, and I think this is insightful to, to add is I think the unique responses that we do to bigger guys uh, and stronger guys are probably the same techniques that transcend to a street fight more than anything else. Because uh, give you a perfect example. I think Hajar Gracie used to say this, that like during comps, he would almost only go for chokes. Mm. And the reason why is because you can't, you can't brute force out of a choke. No you'll, you'll pass out. Right. And if you pass out, you lose. Right. So, but on an arm, for instance, if you're in finals in worlds and you're up on points and the guy has you an arm bar, what are you going to do? Most of those guys aren't tapping. Wait it out. They're letting their arm break. Right. Really? Big, yeah. Oh yeah. Oh That's yeah. Crazy to me. They, they don't care. Right. Cause they're, they're up in points. So they're going to win. Yeah. And so some of those guys, there if, is no in world. If let's say in that scenario, if you and I are rolling and you break my arm, are they going to call the match? No, I have to tap for him to call it. Yeah. So I could just roll with a totally, broken arm. Totally. Totally. Damon at no unified, idea. he's caught some, uh, uh, uh what, what are their name? The, Shoot, I'm going to slaughter names. I'm not going to even attempt. But um, he's caught guys with a heel hook. Here the knee, oh, pop, 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 pop. Shit. Guy just keeps playing because he's up on points. So these guys are crazy. It's high stakes for them, right? This is their careers. And so they're kind of like, hey, if I'm in a, in a finals 
I'm not going to lose by a broken limb. But if that was a choke, there, there's nothing you can do. Yeah, passed out. They're passed out. That's a tap. You're done. Yeah, exactly. So, and I think those same process applies to street fights. It's like, what are you going to do after you break his arm? Right. He's still going to come up, bang you with the other fist, or he's going to kick you. Like, there's other things that happen. And so, I think that same philosophy to big guys managing distance, so they're not smashing you, going for blood chokes primarily over limbs. Those are all applicable, I think, to a street fight more so than anything else as well. So I, I think that same transcends. That's crazy. I had no idea about the broken oh, limb thing. Oh, those guys, I've seen tons. Kimuras, you, you see the arm like, no, you know, and they just keep training. Yeah. Oh, that's insane. I know. Especially, well, I'm too, I mean, well, being out of jujitsu for a, a year because I didn't want to lose a match. I'm like, screw that. Well, you know, not these to guys mention, are, you have other things too. Yeah. <laughs> Career, so, job, another life. Kids, yeah. Family. Yeah. yeah. But you think about it, some of these career guys, these jujitsu practitioners that this is their life. Like they've been training for worlds for a year, all year. Right. It's coming down to this. So to them, it's that's like, insane. Hey, it's worth not tapping. Yeah. Right. All right. So next question. Gnarly. All right. Brian Grogan. I've spent most of my life in a network of men, in teams of men. I've had it to bear witness to many of their deaths as well. I've had many friends die. How will we honor those brothers in the Iron Council when that eventually comes? That's a good question. That's know, a really good question. I know that he's, he's paid a lot. You know, he's, he served our, our country uh, as a former Navy SEAL and has done a lot. And, of course, the sacrifice that he's made, that his family's made, and then his brothers that, that he's, he's seen go. I don't, I don't know. I almost don't feel justified in like comparing the two, but I will because that's the question he's asking. But I I want to put that out there is that I think that's, I don't want to say a different level. I just think it's a different sacrifice and and I don't want to lump it into that because I feel like maybe it would be a little disrespectful in a way, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, But how do we honor not only his men that he's lost, his brothers and sisters that he's lost, uh, but, but the people in the Iron Council or your family, your friends or whoever it may be, frankly, you live the, the kind of life worthy of, in, in this case, their sacrifice. Yeah. Um, if there isn't some sort of sacrifice, you still live a life worthy of their teachings and guidance and mentoring. You know, I, I think about my family. Well, my mom, for example, you know, it, it, odds are she's going to pass away before I do. That's a weird thing to even think about. Yeah. So how do I honor her memory by upholding the standard and everything that she's taught me? Yeah. And, and when I have things that go my way because I'm implementing lessons and experiences and conversations and stories that she shared with me from the time I was born to up until now, I can take pride knowing that it was her that instilled that upon me and, and be happy about that rather than be miserable I think a lot of people look at death as something miserable. And, it, you know, it, it, to a degree, it definitely is, especially if it's unexpected. But you obviously have to overcome that. But it can also be very, it's, it's natural, obviously, obviously, but it can also be a very good thing in that if you honor these people correctly, it's like, man, you honor their life. Yeah. And how they showed up and what they taught you, and what they instilled upon you and why you're a better human being because that individual was in your life. And that's something I actually strive to be is whether it's in this podcast or on the mat or in order of men or iron council or as a, as a husband or a, a, a father is I want people to be better because I was in their life. Yeah. And, and it sounds like in Brian's case, of course, he's got brothers that are like that. Uh, we have friends that are like that, that we're better because those people are in our lives. So it's not an opportunity to self-destruct, which I think a lot of people do. Yeah. And they'll wallow in, in, in their own pity and misery. And of course, it's hard. I'm not saying it isn't. But live a life worthy of what these people taught you. And, and, and I think about, too, is if that individual is still around, what advice would they be giving you? Yeah. Yeah. Right, like if you're asking that question, okay, what if your your closest brother in arms was still with you, and you and you and him lost somebody else? What advice would he be giving you? And I'd be willing to bet he'd be giving something similar. Yeah. Hey, let's live a life worthy of their sacrifice. Let's remember them. Let's honor them by our actions, by our words, by our deeds, and the way that we show up. Totally. Well, and I think the fact that life is limited, 
is the very thing that makes it precious, right? True. Great so, point. So, I mean, if we, if, if it's not limited, then we would all probably be wasting it far more than we, we already do, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah I think that's true. Yeah. So do you think there's an aspect of this that, that maybe from, because when I read Brian's question, I really feel it's like a little bit of how do we do this in the IC? Like, is there, I don't know, is there a future idea of IC brothers that have passed that we, you I know, or is, yeah. or do you think a little bit of that is, is comparing to kind of like the, the soldier, the military side of it and you don't want to do that or I don't no, know. I don't think do it, you get what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah, I do. Yeah. And I don't think that it's, I don't think if we were to honor our iron council brothers that way, that would be disrespectful. I don't take it like that unless yeah. we took some sort of Com symbolism or something yeah. directly from what the seals were doing or some unit like that. Yeah. I wouldn't feel disrespectful about that. It is that it isn't something I've actually considered at all. So mm. I can't tell you this is what we would do or this is how we would do it. But, uh, it is an interesting thing, especially for those guys who have been around for some, you know, measurable amount of time. These are guys who have given a lot of contribution to what we're doing. And I'm wondering if consideration, I wonder if it did naturally just present itself, right? If, it if might. we had, if we had someone that passed away, that's been in the IC yeah, for a while, might. we'd probably naturally say, okay, how do we honor this guy? Yeah. And, yeah. It would almost be cool. Like I think about sports teams where, you know, you retire a Jersey, for example, yeah. like it would almost be cool if we had somebody who was, uh, very instrumental in growing and developing the iron council. Like not, not like you or anything like yeah, yeah. someone more, more important, important. Yeah. Where we would, uh, <laughs> <laughs> where we would, I don't know, have a seat at the table. You know? Yeah. Yeah. So, something like that. I don't know. Yeah. Or even just, I don't know. Yeah. Some worth consideration. Yeah. What's, what's hope we don't have to come up with yeah. this anytime soon. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> odds are that we are with 500 guys, it's bound to happen. Yeah. And you know, unfortunately maybe it already has. Well, it has. If yeah. you remember, I think, uh, we had a guy in echo. Oh, that's right. Pass away a few, a couple of years ago. Yeah. Yeah. He wasn't a member very long. Yeah. But nonetheless still a member. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Something we're thinking about. Yeah, for sure. All right, Tom Kingwell. Uh, really good question here, Tom. This is a little... Are these well, Facebook questions? No, these, these are, are all on Iron Council. Iron Council. Oh, you, yeah. you did those first. Okay. Yeah, Bubba, Brian, and Tom had okay. some questions from the IC, and then we'll jump into Facebook. So, cool. so Tom's question, uh, do you think of the self-help epidemic is leading to people being unsatisfied with their lives and instrumentalizing people, moments and memories to get ahead and that perhaps turning to some good old fashioned truths, values, and ways of life would bring greater contentment. So I think what Tom's referring to, <clears throat> and I can't remember the gentleman's name, but there is a uh, Danish philosopher, I believe, who wrote a book. He was on Art of Manliness. I just listened to this podcast okay. last week or something. Yeah. And he was talking. He was talking about, about this. the self help. Yeah. And so I'm thinking Movement. this is probably where this is coming from. Okay. The podcast was really fascinating because he said that uh, the self, that there is a problem with self-help and that everybody's trying to develop and grow and build in every facet of life. And it's like, man, we can't ever be satisfied with where we are and, mm. and who like we are. Like nothing's ever good enough. And it's, right. Yeah. And we always have to be doing this work on ourselves. And if mm. we're, you know, I took a nap before we did this podcast and heaven forbid I'd take a nap because that's downtime. It's wasted time. I like, oh, can't be doing that. Right? Yeah. But do you think really that many people are like going that hardcore? No, I think <laughs> you know it's, what I'm no. like, I, they I, might talk about, yeah, that, I think it's the other like, side, right? Yeah, I think sure. everyone's running their mouth about, Oh, I need to do, I'm on top of the world. And it's yeah. like, Oh, but I'm going to start Monday, you know, but there is. So one of the things that he mentioned, Tom mentioned is this, uh, I think he called it in instrumentaliza instrumentalization. Yeah. And what that is, is that you're using all of your resources and relationships and everything you have as an instrument to get ahead. So for example, awesome. you and I, Kip, maybe, maybe we're friendly, yeah. but I'm only using it because you're adding value to the podcast, right? Yeah. Or, or you, you so, find this other relationship. So the you, relationships are superficial because of that. It's an instrument. It's simply an instrument mm. as opposed to intrinsically valuable. Totally. Right? Like I find our relationship intrinsically valuable. Yeah. So if we weren't doing a podcast together or I wasn't getting something out of the deal, I feel like you and I would still have a, a friendship. Yeah, totally. But there's a lot of people who who only do it to, and I call it gaming the system, right? Yeah. They're only friendly because they hope to get from it. 
Totally. It's not that the thing is intrinsically valuable. Jiu-jitsu is actually a great exam- example of this. Jiu-jitsu, to me, is intrinsically valuable in that whether I use it as an instrument to save my life or not, I'm going to do it because it's valuable in and of itself. Yeah. It, it does lead to something else. It has but, positive results, of course. but it's not just the results you're seeking for. Right. Yeah. Same thing with exercise. So a lot of guys will say, and, and I think there's a balance here. I, I mm-hmm. think there is value in using resources and assets as an instrument, but a lot of guys will exercise so they can get down to 15% body fat or, the, or, or lower, or they'll exercise so they can get the beach body physique when maybe they ought to just be exercising because... It's It's intrinsically valuable. Yeah, you should do it. Right, and that's it. Like they're almost like you don't need a reason to do these things. You don't need a reason to be friendly. You don't need a reason to practice jujitsu. You don't need a reason to exercise. You just do it because it's good in and of itself. Yeah. So that's what he's referring to. I I think if I had to guess, that's what he's referring to. And and I, even though you haven't answered the question yet, so we'll we'll let you answer the question. But I, I can totally relate to this. Like I've told, I've had, um, I've had, well, how do I say this without like, cause I don't want to like throw anybody under the bus. I've had relationships where like, I really honestly feel the only reason that relationship existed was for that benefit. Oh, for sure. It was about connections to certain people is about improving their network or whatever, but it was very almost like crazy superficial. And it sucks. It's and not it's like, a great uh, way to, yeah, it's, I mean, you might get what you want and I guess there's value in that, but I, I don't know. I'm, I, but I, but from my perspective, I saw it like I could tell, oh, you know course. what I mean? And so it really didn't benefit because then I was immediately like, I didn't have that a long-term established relationship that was positive. Sure. Right. It felt very superficial. Sure. Right. Yeah. And I was okay with it. Like from a, from a superficial perspective, and maybe you know, you were okay I just with realized it, it was just superficial from it too. Yeah. And yeah. so maybe the, the like, arrangement, yeah. whether it was spoken or not, was, hey, we realize we're not friends, but yeah. like you're going to get something from me. I'm going to get something from you. And, and I'm not saying there's not value in that. There is. Yes, there's still some value. Sure. What, but I, what I think what's interesting, and we talked about this at the main event, you know, you had me kind of speak on connection. Yeah. And I really think in the end, like we're, we're talking like Brian's question about, you know, we're talking about death a little bit. In the end, those relationships and those connections, the ones that were superficial are the ones we're probably going to like regret and not feel like fulfilled about. Oh, well, we might you get what I'm saying about them. Yeah. Yeah. And so it's, there's a price though, mm-hmm. right? Because that's Your not the finite. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And those, and those aren't the kind of relationships that you want to ultimately leave right. with. You know what I'm saying? Like yeah. you'd want to really spend your time fully engaged and, and really strong relationships with people, yeah. something not so superficial, but I, I think mm. about this a lot with social media and it's weird for me to say, because I've made a career of being on social media. Man, that's tough though, too, though, right? Cause it has to be somewhat superficial. for what I do. Yeah. Yeah. But what's interesting is, and, and I try not to be this way. And I think I do a fairly good job at it because when I meet people, a lot of guys will say, Oh, you're the same guy that, I, that you are on social media. Mm. Right. And Almost, that's a compliment. You're like, I oh, take good. that as a compliment. Yeah. Because what they're saying in the way I perceive Ryan's authentic. That, <laughs> no, not authentic. Genuine. <laughs> genuine. That's right. um, the way that I perceive them saying that is they thought that what I was doing was a game. Mm. And, and I don't take that personally. I just think that they've been let down so many times before that they're like, oh, this, probably, this guy's probably just. Yeah. To see you genuine, they're like, oh, that's refreshing. That's exactly right. So the question then becomes, would you do it? if you didn't get any accolades about it. Yeah. Like, would you practice jujitsu if you couldn't take some pictures and post them and get some praise? Yeah. Would you would. Yeah. But there's probably people who wouldn't. Yeah. Totally. Right? Would Cause you, that's part of the persona that, that are creating for themselves. Saying. Yeah. Would you, would you hunt? Would you, do you really treat your children that way? Like if yeah. you aren't getting recognized and if, and if you're answering that question, like oh, maybe I wouldn't and you're being truthful, then there's probably some, what is the term instrumentalization happening? happening. Yeah. Here, right. Yeah. Which is very, I mean, what's before my legs are falling asleep on, I know, the stools. on these stools. These stools are not good. We're gonna have to rethink this. Just show some thigh. Just the, yeah, show a little leg. Um, but I think, I don't know, but that's so natural, right? Like every damn thing everyone does Dude. every day, oh, every darn thing <laughs> everyone does has to do with looking good, 
Like it's it's in our fabric. It, it's, it's how you survival. dress. It's, it's a survival strategy. Yeah. Too. So to say you're it's old as man. Yeah. It's super hard not to do that. I get. I think the idea is maybe be aware that you're doing it, right? And well, kind and of put your yourself too. in check and your motives. Yeah. Right. Like I I try to dress well because it makes me feel good about myself. For example, and it helps establish some credibility and authority potentially. Totally. Not necessarily because I'm going to get a bunch of praise for, you know, or, yeah. and I'm not saying I'm a great dresser. I'm yeah. just saying, that's just an example. Yeah, but you're not naive enough to say either that, oh, it doesn't matter how I dress. No, people are going to judge you based well, on how you dress and, and how this. you present like, yourself. We've got yeah. our computers and we've got all this stuff and this gear and we've got the desk and then I put the flags up. Like I was intentional about if you're listening or you're watching this on video. Yeah. Like it's not like I didn't think this through. Yeah. <laughs> so is it instrumental, instrumentalization? I have a hard time saying that. The answer is yes, it is instrumentalization. Yeah, totally. So we're not saying that's bad. Yeah. Just not let it be the driving factor maybe. Or balance it with, Hey, I just do this because it's inherently valuable to me. Yeah. Certain things in your life. Maybe there should be some things that are. So do we answer Tom's question? I don't know. We yapped about it long enough. <laughs> yeah. He was just, is asking. it leading people to being unsatisfied with their lives? Oh, for sure. Because you're comparing yeah. yourself to other people. And, and, and I know I'm really guilty of this. In fact, I think I talked about it uh, last week on last week's podcast is, my patience and I'm looking at what other people are doing. I'm like, why don't I have that? Why don't I have this? And it's like, you know, actually that's one of the reasons that I really enjoy our move to Maine is because the pace is a lot slower. There's definitely less here in Maine of the notion of keeping up with the Joneses. Mm. I noticed a lot of that in Southern Utah. Yeah. And, uh, I don't know if it's just inherently built into the culture or what, but I noticed it's like, well, this guy got a new vehicle and that guy got a boat and this guy's yeah. house is a hundred square feet bigger than mine. And yeah, it's, but it's so hard not to do it. It is hard, Man. but here it doesn't feel like that. Yeah. And, it's a lot better. And <laughs> people don't seem to care as much about that. And I like that because the pace of life is a little slower. I'm not worried about super superficial items as much. It's not as relevant in my life. And I can focus on the things that are meaningful to me, like, like being fully present for my kids and, being deeply engaged and connected with my wife and, and doing work that's meaningful and significant to me, not worrying about what my neighbor, John, the new truck he just bought and why I don't have the 2019. I have the 2017 Yeah, yeah. or 2020 or whatever, you know, totally, totally. Yeah. Asia and I, we have to, we have, we check ourselves every so often from that perspective. I mean, you've been you in my house, to. like you, you cross that road and the house, like the neighbor, the general neighborhood in which we live in, is very wealthy. I bet. Yeah. And oh, it yeah, is super sure. tough sometimes to be driving my, you know, driving the uh, stingray that's like a boat built in the 80s. You know what I mean? And then like, you know, the neighbors across the street, they have the new Air Nautique that's right. like worth more than our other rental home. Yeah. You know I mean? yeah. And it's like, man, our boat sucks. You well, know? Who cares? You but know? do you get it's what like, I'm saying? But it's care. But it's a very natural thing to like, ah, uh, you know, and you have to kind of like, wait, nah, you know what? It's good enough. And and we're, and we're purposely putting our attention and value elsewhere. That's the difference. You said, use the word yeah. purposely. That's exactly right. You made a deliberate, intentional decision to, to have that boat or to drive that car or to live in that house. And I think once you are more clear and more intentional about the choices you're making, then you're more, you're, you're, you're better positioned to not be so swayed by what other people are doing. Totally. It's the same thing with the, 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 the FOMO, right? Fear of missing out. Mm. Have you heard, you've heard, uh -uh. okay, so FOMO is like FOMO. fear of missing out. Like, oh, I'm assuming teenage kids, social media. For sure. It's like, but yeah. not just teenage kids. I mean, grown men, mm. you know, I'm sure there's people who right now see us here at immersion and they're like, oh man, I'm really missing out. I want to be at camp. Dude, you made, you made a choice not to be here. Yeah. So that's okay. Like m make a choice and yeah, you might be saddened or want to be out here, but you made that choice. If you were deliberate and intentional about that choice and you thought about it and you worked through it and you still made the other choice. Cool. Take comfort Perfect. in knowing mm. that I made this choice for a reason. Yeah. So Same. when I see somebody with a brand new car and I get this idea of like, well, I want a new truck. I'm like, no, no, wait, I made a choice not to have a brand new truck because I would like to spend this money and allocate these resources over here, not towards the vehicle. Yeah. And then that seems to put things in perspective and check a little bit. Yeah, totally. Otherwise what you end up doing is just, 
uh, well, almost like a woe is me or uh, this sucks. I wish I had it. I wish, I wish, I wish. And then you're just feeling shitty about yourself because right. you're not. Or <laughs> chasing what everybody else has. And then which will never be satisfying. Because yeah. you could actually have what other people have. You're like, well, I, you know, I really want to have what Kip has. So I buy the same car. Or I live in the same neighborhood. And all of a sudden I'm pursuing your dreams instead of mine. Yeah. Because I'm yeah. like playing which, catch up to you. Which might be temporary. Sure. But no long, you're gonna no be long-term happy. satisfaction. <laughs> yeah, you're yeah. going to be happy for a minute, and then it's going to go away. It's fleeting. Yeah. Hmm. Very insightful. All right, Facebook. So these questions are from facebook.com uh, slash group slash order of man. Yep. So Jason Wiley Shoe, not a question. Don't, Dude, don't even read Jason, it. Jason, what the hell? <laughs> <laughs> oh, what the crap? I think we have corrected you, what, three or four times Yeah, now? that's four We're times. Gonna, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just... Every actually, time I'm done. Swear. I'm done, actually, for the rest of this episode. No we'll see. Swearing. We'll okay. see. I, I left this in here because it's... Well, it made me feel good when, when I read it, so... What, um, is it, what, what would you classify as a swear word? Like, is, you know... You Based just, upon how, how my social condition... Right, because... How I was raised? We basically just... Swear words are just, are just noises. Yeah. With, with social with interpretation. Meaning. And that's what you talk about a lot. Yeah. Is like, it's the meaning we attach to it. <laughs> that's why I justify a swear. <laughs> so what is a swear word? I guess it's different well, for everybody. But I think it's okay. Because we also might have, we're totally going to riff on this. There might be a drawback. Or we, it may be really easy for us to say, well, our social condition is just a word, blah, blah, blah. It's not a big deal. But let's be real. Like, oh, it's important. There, there are important social conditions yes which benefit you and hinder you and, and, and affect you and in your social condition. And if we agree on the Would meaning, you? like let's take language. People say, well, it's just words. Well, yes, technically, or excuse me, it's just noises. Yes, technically you're making noises with your lungs and your diaphragm and your vocal cords and the air passing through that. That's technically what's happening. But if we collectively agree that this particular noise means dot, 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 that's important. That's what it means. Because... Yeah. Like thinking about having a conversation or thinking about understanding how you feel about certain situations or thinking about you trying to teach me a technique. If we didn't agree on the meaning of that word, how well yeah. would this whole thing work? So totally. yes, they are just noises, but words are important. Totally. And the meaning that we give them are important. Totally. Well, and I always thought, I always love this thought process that anyone that says, you know, words don't have meaning then say, okay, well, what's the internal dialogue that you speak in? It's right. in language. It's in language. When you internalize something, when you demonize someone or you're angry about something, all of your thought process is based on language. Right. Or even you saying words don't have meaning. Those words you just use have, have meaning. meaning. Yeah, <laughs> totally. Because <laughs> if they didn't, I wouldn't understand what those noises are. Yeah, yeah. It's totally crazy. <laughs> All right. So Jason's comment, he says, I wanted to thank you, Ryan. It's a pleasure listening and taking your advice and opinions. I've learned a lot about myself, communicated better with my daughter, my mom, and my future wife, and Kip for your parenting advice. I'm a man in the fire, uh, New York Fire Department, and landscape, and I landscape on the side. I listen to you guys cutting grass and driving to work. So thank you. I've been listening for three years now. That's awesome. That's yeah. Jason. Yeah. Jason, appreciate you, man. We need, yeah. we need the support. We appreciate the support. We need great men in this fight. Uh, sounds like you're on the right path and the right track and honored to stand with you in this, uh, this, this whole notion of reclaiming and restoring masculinity. Yeah. Super cool. Very cool. Thanks, Jason. All right. Thomas Kylie, how to maintain a healthy work and home relationship while having two kids under two years old? Um, I don't think it's, I mean, the tactics might be different for having a kid that's, you know, nine and seven, Yeah. but I don't think it's any different really. Yeah. Uh, it's going to be, again, the tactics are going to be different, right? You're not going to be playing catch with your kids when they're two years old, Yeah. but you're going to be spending a time with, with them. You're going to be rolling on the ground. I mean, I, how to maintain balance is have the boundaries established. Communicate and you're saying the, the balance, regardless of age, right? The balance matter. act is an act period. Like, right. yeah, yeah. you're going to struggle with balance. I actually yeah. think it's a lot harder for men. How do I, how do I word this? I, th I think it's harder for men to connect with babies yeah. Because all they do is sleep <laughs> and poop and eat and cry. Yeah. And we don't, we didn't have them in the womb. There's no connection. Now, granted, when my children were born, all four of them were born, I was connected. I loved them immediately. Yes. But they weren't in my body for nine months. Like they, they weren't relying upon me. There wasn't really yeah. that connection. And that connection, I don't really think develops until 
kids start getting older and you know dad gets more involved well and and even in their early years they're so they're still reliant on mom oh 100 percent. it's like watching watching our 10 month year old it's like i have to tell my wife to get out of the house yeah because he is if he sees her and i'm holding him he's like dude let go of me i I want want mom." mom yeah yeah so i mean they're just naturally more dependent on her so that relationship's different yeah yeah so i think for for a man for a father it's harder to connect with with babies and toddlers. And so I, I really think that we need, need to make a conscious effort to be involved and be present and engage with our kids, even at that age, to the best that we can. It's easy when they can play catch. Yeah. yeah. It's easy when they can it's wrestle. It's just a good excuse. You're ground. like, oh, honey, I got to go play I gotta catch go play with Tommy. Catch. I got to go wrestle. <laughs> it's e- that's easy. Yeah. It's when they're young two, four, you know, three years old where it's like, okay, yeah, I got to be engaged. I got to be present. But yeah. as far as keeping the balance, is that what, is that the term you yeah, used? I, yeah. The balance. Yeah. Just having healthy work home relationship. Yeah. Just have those boundaries, leave work at work, leave home at home. Um, whenever I try to do something, even now, uh, if I'm podcasting, I'm podcasting. Okay. If I'm playing catch with my kids, I'm playing catch with my kids. Yeah. You're not trying to do both. Right. And that's one thing I fall prey to a lot. Like I notice you have your phone out. I got my phone. All of us are within arm's reach of our phone at a giving point. This is a problem for me because my work is right here in my pocket and yeah. it's so easy to like pull this out and, oh, oh, oh I, I just got to send this email real quick. And, and my kids see that and my wife sees that and yeah. they don't interpret it as dad has to send an email. They interpret it as that's more important than me. Totally. So I really try and I'm not great at it. But I really try to be fully present in the moment, whether it's training this week or doing this podcast right now or playing catch with my kids or on a date with my wife. It's like, that's the, that, that's the thing. Yeah. And I'm going to be the best at that thing in that moment. Yeah. I have a perfect example of this. When I, I recently, I was just got divorced uh, from my ex-wife. Um, I just graduated college. I was working full time and it was my first summer Mm. with the kids full time. Mm. So it was this first new experience of, and it was a little chaotic, right? I was like, Oh, wait a second. So I have them full time. Yeah. So I got to find a sitter in the morning. You know, my work was roughly about an hour away. So I'd have to drop them. Like I had to find daycare that was crazy early. I had to pick up like, by the way, like that whole system doesn't even work. I'm like, what? I have to pick them up at 3.30? Like, that's not even a full day's of work. Like, and so I got into this predicament where I was like, okay, I'd have to pick them up by a certain time. It wasn't a full day yet. Right. So then I'd come home. I would try to, like, do some more work. I would try to, like, play. And, and, and I tried to do both. Mm. And, and everyone, anyone that's experienced this, you're going to be able to re- relate to this immediately. I was pissed off yep. half the time. Yep. Stop talking. You guys are being too loud. I, I've constantly, because I can't focus, I was yelling at my kids. They're wanting to play. They're being innocent in the process. I'm stressed out. And I tried that for, and literally for like a couple of weeks and I was just losing my mind. I was mm. just like, Oh my gosh, like I am. And then I feel guilty because yep. I was yelling at them and they would, it would get late because I've didn't get the work done. And so now they're going to bed late and it was just, Oh my gosh, it was like Brutal, a snowball man. scenario. And then I remember uh, one of those days, I eventually was like, I kind of had this mentality. I just walked in the house and I was just like, F it. Like, who cares? And I just put the laptop away and I played Legos on the, on the carpet. Right. And just did whatever they wanted to do. And I just, it's almost like it felt like careless. I'm just going to throw work to the side. I'm not going to worry about a thing. It doesn't matter. And I just was present with my kids. And that's a boundary. Yeah. And even now, I would even say that even for dads of like littler kids that are talking about that, even with my 10-month-year-old ten, ten right now, Keiko, it's way more enjoyable actually if I just go into his room mm-hmm. and play with the little blocks. Right. He enjoys it and I enjoy it. It's when I'm like, oh, let me clean the house and do this while I'm holding him. That's when it's stressful. So sometimes is- it's like turn off the light and just 
focus on that one thing. And it is hard because we have a lot of demands. You know, you talk about cleaning the house and you've got your job and you've got the business and you've got your wife and you've got your other kids. Yeah. It is really hard. And so I would say this is a boundaries thing. And this is also a time management thing as well. Yeah. You need to be hyper efficient. That's why being present is so important with whatever role you're playing is because at work. So your efficiency is insanely high. Like I know. So one of the things I did years and years ago in my financial planning practice is I decided that I was going to call my day the, the end of the week at two o'clock on Friday afternoon. Like I didn't want to work till five o'clock. I wanted on to a start Friday, yeah. on a Friday. And for the longest time I waffled back and forth because I thought that I wouldn't get as much done. But what was interesting is when I shortened the time frame from five to two, I actually got more done yeah. than I would yeah. in a quote unquote normal work day because I knew that I had a hard stop at two o'clock. And so I was hustling, 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 trying to get that stuff done uh, and, and so it, it just, to me, it taught me a lesson that why didn't I stop every day at two o'clock and what in the world have I been doing with <laughs> three to four hours every day for the last five or six years totally. when I could have been much more effective yeah. and efficient. Um, and it, there's also times where maybe you should, that's a work thing. At home, I would say, unless you're maybe working on a project, potentially cleaning the house, making dinner maybe doing some chores yeah i don't look at trying to be efficient with my kids yeah yeah it's not gonna work no it's like let's get 10 throws each in with a football and we'll do this drill and no it's like i'm not gonna be efficient with that i'm gonna say okay i've got i've got this time block and we're gonna use all of it as and just much do as we can and we're gonna yeah. let it go wherever it wants to go totally there's been numerous scenarios i've crunches right it's like i got two hours to right. like get this done yeah and and then you get it done, you're like, geez, yeah, that was that was, that was better, really easier productive. Than I thought it was, yeah. And then it makes you it makes wonder, you like, oh, geez, I, could I have done even more yesterday? Exactly. <laughs> if I was just nar- like that's laser exactly focused, right. yeah, yeah, that's gnarly. All right, uh, Clay Grigsba. In your opinion, what movie character best exemplifies masculinity, manhood, and sovereignty? <laughs> uh, the two movies that immediately come to mind, maybe three, is. Braveheart, Patriot, and Gladiator. Oh, man. Well, I, did, I, you... I was going to throw Last of the Mohicans in there. Oh, that's true. That would be a good <laughs> point, too. That would be a good one, too. But, yeah, those yeah those four, yeah. including Last of the Mohicans, that, those are the four I'd come up with. Yeah, me too. Those are good movies. Easy. All right. Uh, Joshua. a tough one. I know. Joshua. Like music. Uh, Shoebridge. Music, I struggled I know, music. the music one. Did you see? A couple guys had posted some things I didn't yeah. listen to. They had some pretty, classes. they had some interesting songs I've never actually oh, even really? heard before. Oh, I, was I like, did see what? one and I, never I was heard intrigued, these songs. but then I got distracted and didn't end up going, so yeah. going back around. I have, there's, a, there's one song that is pretty, I'll share it to you with, with you later tonight. Right. Maybe that, that's pretty it solid. It's a, it sounds weird. I'll it's, share it with you later tonight. Yeah, that's. Don't say it like that. <laughs> I'm swearing you're you're uh, you're going inappropriate. No, you went inappropriate. <laughs> I just called it out. All right, Joshua Shoebridge. How can we fight against some of the negative negativity that exists in our communities? Just be positive. Yeah. Just be the shining example of the kind of man that that you have a desire to be. The kind of men who you are inspired by. I don't think I don't think you fight against it. No. I don't think you're like, well, that's negative, and so we can't be that way. Or I'm going to argue with everybody for right, being negative. Yeah. Right. I think that's negative in and of itself. I think the best way that you fight this, fight this, quote unquote, fight this, is be the kind of man that your community deserves and your community needs. And so step up, be empathetic to, to individuals, be compassionate, uh, be service oriented. Uh, enlist other people, volunteer your time and money and effort and resources. The other day, for example, Pete uh, Roberts, he asked if he could use my side-by-side for this camp. Hmm. And I said, yeah, if, of course. Yeah, that's not a problem at all because he was going to rent them. And I'm like, don't, don't rent. He even asked yeah. if he could rent it for me. I'm like, no, dude, like you just friends. You yeah. don't need to rent it from me. And so we, we busted out a couple of days earlier and, and I'm like, Hey, Brack, my son, I'm like, Hey, come, come out and, and we're, we're going to clean this side by side. So we washed it down and everything. He's like, dad, why are we washing it? And I said, because that's what we do. Like yeah. we're going to let somebody borrow it and we're going to wash it. And so it's we're, nice for so them. So it's nice. And we yeah. go out of our way and take a little bit of extra measures to make sure that what we're delivering mm. is excellent. 
yeah, we don't have to do that. Maybe he doesn't even expect us to. And you know what? Maybe he didn't think anything twice of it. But we're, we, we do things with excellence. And yeah. so we cleaned it. We took a little extra time. That, that's what I'm talking about is, is go the extra mile and do the extra thing. And people will recognize that and see that and, and go out of your way. I, I, that's, that's how you, I'm not going to say fight, but that's how you counterbalance the potential negativity or the selfishness and, and put it in the, the right light, which is abundance and prosperity and service and, and, yeah. and putting others' needs potentially even above your own at times. When I think of the average guy, the, what they probably struggle with, I would assume it is getting out of their comfort zone and having like conversations. Like I'm thinking about just origin, for instance. There's huge opportunity for me to get at, out of my shell, mm -hmm. sit down at a table with some guys that I don't even know. Watch the flag here. Look, did I almost touch the order of band flag? Oh, okay. Over. <laughs> <laughs> so, but to get out of my comfort zone and actually like get to know other guys and have conversations with them, I'm assuming most guys probably struggle in that space more than anything. Probably. Would you agree? It's, it's hard for me to fathom that, but I yeah. think you're probably right. Yeah, because that's really uncomfortable, right? It can be. Uh, I think it's something that I, – I definitely think it's a personality thing, but I also think it's a practice thing. Yeah. You know, just put yourself out there. It's easy at events like this because we're all here to meet and we yeah, all have this common denominator yeah. and things. But, yeah, I think putting yourself out there because there's risk in that. Right, even if it's just sitting down at, at lunch with somebody here, there's risk in sitting down at that table and saying, hey, you guys mind if I sit down? You're, maybe you're interrupting a conversation or maybe you think, oh, these guys are going to think I'm weird. Yeah. And so there's, there's a level of risk. But so what? <laughs> like really how bad could it be? Yeah. You know? Yeah, but to your point, I think a lot of what, what you're, you're telling uh, Clay here is like, a lot, a lot of the counterbalance to negativity is us being uncomfortable yes. and doing these things that are uncomfortable, whether right. it's reaching out and creating new connections and being a quote unquote lighthouse through your conversation or, or making the extra effort on cleaning the side by side or offering services or moving people. Like it's almost safe to say that every counter to the negativity is uncomfortable. Oh, a hundred percent. Yeah. Like I, I actually had somebody the other day said, man, you guys just moved here. You know, a lot of people. I'm like, of course we do. Yeah. Because we go out of our way to embed ourselves and assimilate inside of the community. So what am I doing to do that? I'm inviting people over to my house. I have bows. I'm like, and I knew a guy, he, he, he wanted to shoot. I'm like, yeah, just come on. I got a bunch. Like you can just come over, come over and yeah. try it out, you know? And, and there's parades and there's all kinds of things and we're trying to embed ourselves into the community by serving and, and it is awkward and it is uncomfortable and it does stretch us outside of our comfort zone. Not so much me cause I'm used to it and I actually enjoy it. I see it yeah. as a challenge, but certainly members of my family. Yeah. They're are like, like oh, this, I don't know. This is hard. <laughs> and I'm like voluntar involuntarily thrusting them into it, you know, yeah, yeah. but yeah, it is uncomfortable, yeah. but that's what it requires yeah. if you're going to be that kind of man. And I'm assuming that's rewarding, right? I enjoy it. Yeah. And I like the fact that we know people. Yeah. I like that we're part of the community. That's valuable to me. Totally. I like, I like feeling like I'm part of the community. Yeah. And that requires effort. I think what a lot of people think is that, okay, I'm moving to this new place. And I think this is especially true a lot in our culture, yeah. our religious culture, that somehow... They need to, they need to reach, reach out, out to me. And, yeah. and what, what, what is it called? Um, fellowship. Fellowship. They need to reach out and they need to embrace us as the, no, 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 no. You're going into their house. Yeah. It's your, now, should they? Sure. Of course. Yeah. But ultimately but it's not yeah. their responsibility. You want to get to know, I've had people say that all the time. Oh, I went to church and nobody said hi. I'm like, cool. How many people did you say hi to? Well, uh, they should be saying hi to me. It's like. What you're not owed anything. Yeah. You know, go out there, establish yourself, put yourself in, be assertive. And, and I think you're going to eliminate this, this whole thing. Like somebody owes me something else. Yeah, totally. And, and I, I, a perfect example of that in my life is my wife. How so? Every neighbor within a, I don't know, they mile. Know yeah. We know everybody. Right. Why? 
because she's made it a point. She sees a new she's neighbor move in. She's over to the house. Hi, nice to meet you. My name's Asia. And she's, but, but what's great about it is you ask all those people, what's their impression that she loves and cares. Right. And isn't like that 100%. nice? Like we were, we went over to our neighbor's house the other night. They're, they're a little bit older and we, we actually really look at them as like grandma and grandpa. Yeah. We got one in our neighborhood that yeah. way. Yeah. And so we went over there and, 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 uh, she, she was talking with us and she said, Oh, um, John was going to go over and get your trash cans. Cause he noticed that you guys weren't home and he was going to go and then he went out and then they were gone. So you, when you were at home, but I was like, that's cool because that means you're looking after us. Totally. And that's why a community is so valuable. Yeah. Is, and we noticed that they hadn't been there for a couple of days. And so, you know, we keep an eye on their house and make sure everything looks good. If there was lights on or the garage was open, I'd run over there and close the garage. I, I would do whatever I could to make sure that everything was taken care of. Or if the mail was out, you know, I'd maybe collect the mail and go around the back and set it on the porch. And they do the same thing because you assert yourself and you go just a little, it's not even hard. Yeah. It's not even hard to extend yourself. It's just uncomfortable. Yeah. And, and it's funny because to your point earlier, so many people think, oh, oh, I moved into a good community Yeah, or, yeah. oh, I oh, love I my a community. Bad community. Yeah. And it's like, <laughs> make it a good community. That's right. If you don't like it, change it. Yeah. And I really think people have that capability of bringing people together. I do too. If you're charismatic enough and willing to be uncomfortable and do it. I don't think you need to be even charismatic. Yeah. It helps, but it yeah. does help. It makes it easier, certainly, but yeah. I think it's just effort. Totally. Yeah. Totally. And we see this in the, in the IC, you know, oh, on guys on sure. battle teams and you're like, you want your battle team to be more accountable? Guess what? All you have to do. Yeah. Start, hey guys, be more I want more start accountability. Start more accountable. Yeah. Create it. It is interesting because we'll see these guys come into the Iron Council and I'll see guys come in and, and, and maybe won't recognize them or their name and I'll see them on a call and, and they'll introduce themselves or they'll share some insight on a Friday call. And I'm like, man, this guy's probably been part of the Iron Council for maybe a year or something. He's like, oh yeah, I joined two weeks ago. Yeah. Has nothing to do with how long they've been a member of the Iron Council. It has everything to do with somebody who's willing to dive like in head first enough. and, and putting himself out there. And man, if you're on a call with, what do we have on average? Maybe 70, 80 guys on a call on Friday. Yeah. That's awkward. I, cause if I was on that call, I'd be like, I don't know if I've earned the right to who's say anything. Guys? And like, what are they going to think of what I say? Totally. And yet we have these gentlemen who come into the Iron Council and they thrust themselves into it. And guess what? They have a significantly better experience than somebody who's just there to take or observe or whatever it is totally. they're there to do. Totally. And what's great I love about this is guys find their voice. Because yeah. you get guys that would normally never share. Right. That would ne th even believe that they had nothing valuable to share. Sure. And then they get in the IC and we kind of put, this, put them in this scenario where like, hey, they you, have to, you need to share from day one, you need to, yeah, you need to communicate. And these guys and we, I, we could rattle off a handful of names where these guys didn't quote unquote, know their voice or where it was. Mm -hmm. But through the Iron Council, they're like, oh man, I do have something right. valuable to share. I think and, about like, and it's awesome. Bubba, I think about John Gilliland is one. I mean, yep. we could go down the list and all of these guys I'm not going to say only through the Iron Council. Of course, there's a lot yeah. of work that happens. But it's there a platform outside. that allowed them to like sure. experiment and find their voice yeah. and start sharing. Yeah. Yeah. Let's take a couple more. We're yeah. at, at almost an hour and I know we got to go here, uh, train in a little go bit. Go get so. beat up by some jujitsu guys. Yeah. Nice. Chase Saxton. What is your biggest accomplishment in your life and what drives you to conquer each day? Biggest I mean, accomplishment. It'd be easy to say like my family. And I feel good about that. I don't, I don't want to give that answer because that's what everybody would say. Yeah. But I'm really proud of what we're creating here with Order of Man. Yeah. And, and 15 I, million downloads. Yes. That we said yes. uh, two weeks ago. A couple weeks ago. Uh, I'm just so proud of what we've created here. I'm, I'm proud of the movement. I'm proud when, even when I come to, to immersion camp and guys are coming up to me, they're like, man, a guy came up to me at lunch. He's like, hey, I drove up here from Philly. It's nine hours. I just wanted to thank you for being with me for half of the journey. And I was like, wait, what do you mean? He's like, oh, I just listened to your podcast. Yeah. And to know that the message that we're sharing and the conversations that we're having are impacting men positively and not just men. Because if I was just impacting your life, I would feel satisfied about that. But now you're going out and you're engaging with your community. You're engaging with teams that you coach. You're engaging with your business and your clients and your colleagues and your family. And this is now generational. Yeah. Right? Because, it, and, and I'm not going to take credit necessarily for that but the fact that we're starting but to there's influence there influence yeah. for that's a great for word sure. for it. influence 
man, I just, I'm so proud of that. So I don't want to dismiss that I'm proud of the marriage that my wife and I have created and we've been together for 17 years, been, been married for 15 years, that we have four beautiful kids, that, that we're here in Maine and we're pursuing our dreams and we have some things, you know, e- even, even tangible things that we're excited about. Like, yeah. that's all like great. Life's and, good. And that's, that's yeah. good. And, and I'm not dismissing that. But I do want to just say, and I, and I think there's this weird thing, like people can't be proud of stuff because they're worried that, it, that it's going to come across as arrogant. Totally. I don't think any rational human being listening to this podcast right now, hearing me say that I'm proud of what we created, is thinking that I'm being arrogant right yeah. now. It's funny how that is. And yet we yeah. feel like, oh, I can't say I'm proud of stuff because what if people... No, be proud of what you created. Don't be overly prideful. Don't let it get in the way of continued progress. But it's okay to be happy with something that you've done or something that you've built or a movement that you've established or uh, a, a helpful hand that you've given. It's okay to be excited about that and be proud of that. And I genuinely am. Yeah. And, and people that are genuinely care for you, they are going to be excited for you. Of course. Yeah. yeah. The only and, people and that's, that we that's criticize a- that are people that probably don't genuinely care anyway. I made a post on Instagram the other day. We had Brandon Lilly over to our place for the main event and... Uh, he was throwing the, ha- uh, the tomahawks. Yeah. I don't know if you saw this yeah, post, but he like ones. threw all three at the same time and they all stuck in one hand. Yeah. He, he had three in one hand and he threw them all and they all stuck. <laughs> yeah. And my boys were watching and they like jumped out of their skin just watching. He's like, yeah, he drove and they just got so excited about it. And, and what it taught me is that, or at least shed some light on is that if you want to know who your friends are, Look at them and watch their reactions when you win. Yeah. If they're congratulating you and lifting you up and propping you up, I got another great example from just yesterday. I'll share that here in a second. But if they're congratulating you and propping you up, you know that somebody is a friend. Yeah. But if they're like... Kind of bothered by it. If they're bothered by it or they're making little underhanded snarky comments or being sarcastic, that's a red flag. I got to be aware of this this dude because this guy might be a, a, a wolf in sheep's clothing. Yeah. Another great example is Joe Parody. You know Joe. Yeah. Uh, that's Pete's father-in-law. He went to Worlds. Um, he is, he he won. Yeah. For I his, saw that. For for black belts for his his age category and all that. And man, he came in last night. Do you? Oh, you weren't here. I don't think. No. You I, got here a little late. So all of us are in the gym, and like I said, there's probably I don't know 200 plus guys in there. Yeah. We're all in the gym. This is We're in get, the big gym. In the big gym. Okay. We're getting ready to train and. Pete must have saw Joe coming or knew he was coming. And so Joe came down and he had his gold medal. <laughs> He's wearing it. Yeah. Because yeah. he wants to show. He's totally, prou- yeah. He should be proud of that. Oh, yeah, he should. Like, that's the point. Be- yeah. It's not arrogant. It's I'm proud of what I've accomplished. And yeah. you have helped me accomplish that. Yeah. And he accomplished it. Yes, he did. <laughs> like, it was it's not. Yeah. 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 So he walks into the gym and everybody just stops what they're doing and just starts clapping. That's all 200 cool. plus guys. And we clap for minutes. And he, you could just see, he's like beaming with pride. And he's like, he just that classic smile. Like if you know Joe, you know exactly what I'm yeah. talking about. And he's like, he just loved it. Yeah. And to me, I thought, these are 200 friends. Yeah. Like these aren't guys who are going to underhand, you know, make underhanded comments or mm-hmm. try to undermine or downplay what somebody has done. Like these are 200. They're truly happy for They're him. They're happy for yeah. him. And they celebrate with him and they prop it up, not try to undermine and tear it down. Yeah, totally. So his, his second portion of this question is what, what drives you to conquer each day? It's, an, it's a fascinating question. Uh, and, and it's one that a lot of people ask. I think they're looking for the, the, the tactic or is that what they're looking for? I you think know. it's kind of like, what is Ryan doing every day to help him conquer? I think these are guys who maybe to some degree don't feel completely satisfied with what they're conquering or how they're accomplishing, mm. or maybe they're lacking some, some motivation or inspiration in their life. So they're looking for what that is. Yeah. I wish I could tell you it's this one thing. And as soon as you find this one thing, it's what it is. All I can say is that for me, what is my drive to conquer? It's just, I want to be the best. Yeah. I, I just, I, anything I do, I just, I want to be the best. When I'm training, I want to be the best white belt. <laughs> and when I'm a, like, I want to, and when I'm doing this podcast, I want to be the best. I wish I could tell you it's because dot, dot, dot. 
Yeah. I don't know where it comes from. Is it, is it you being tied to, like being, I don't know what the term would be, fully connected to your vision? Like that's, that's crystal clear in your mind. And no. so that's what allows no. you to. No. I mean, that's certainly an advantage, but anything I do, I just want to be the best. If I'm going to, like writing a book, for example, I want, I want it to be, I wanted it when I wrote that book last year, about a year and a half ago, that wasn't, I don't enjoy the writing process. It's not something yeah, I, I could, particularly got a lot of value from. Yeah, I can see that. But I wanted it to be the best. And I feel pretty proud of what we accomplished in spite of the fact that it wasn't a particularly enjoyable experience for me. Yeah. Uh, if I'm picking up archery, I want to be the best and I want to be the student and I want to learn all the little nuances and the intricacies. And when I'm watching Jocko give instruction, I'm like, oh, wait, so he twisted his wrist this way. And that was a little nuance that most people wouldn't catch. And, and I, I try to catch those things. Yeah. Because I just, I want to be the best. I don't know if it's my personality. I don't know if it's potentially a chip on my shoulder yeah. that I feel like I have something to prove to myself. I don't know what it is, but I just can't fathom ever doing anything where I'm like, I'm okay if it's kind of just like mediocre. Yeah. Well, I'm wondering if, if some of that has to do with you being present in the moment. Because I don't think that's possible, right? I don't think it's possible for you to be the best student at the time if you're not fully present in that moment. It's, right. not, it's not possible for you to be the best at archery practice today if, if you I'm weren't present. fully present. And, and maybe that allows you to just super narrow laser focus yeah. in the moment. And, that, and, and as we were talking about earlier, that allows you to be way more productive than you would normally. Right. You're fully engulfed. Where I think everyone else is just... Well, I think the opposite of being present is a little bit of like, just trying not to drown, right? It's like, sure. oh, I got so much. I just, I'm trying to juggle. Right. And it's not like fully engulfed in the, in the moment, maybe. Hmm. Maybe. I, I just, yeah, I think you're on the right track. I, I, I wish I could give a great answer because it is something that gets brought up quite a bit. And I, and I have a level of empathy for guys who are in that boat. I, I guess I have been there where I felt overwhelmed or deflated in my life. Um, and I, I, I think it's just a choice. Yeah. You, so who is this? Who's asking this? Uh, Chase Saxton. So Chase, you have a choice to make. And the choice is, are you going to be the best? Or are you just going to be mediocre and complacent? Yeah. And the best at whatever it is that you're whatever doing it is. today. And, it's, and, yeah. and look, even like let's take jujitsu just because we're here. I'm not saying I'm going to be the best jujitsu practitioner that ever existed. That's not what I'm saying. Yeah. I'm saying that when I go to our next class, I am going to be the best student that I possibly can be. Yeah. When, I'm, when I'm training technique, I'm going to train it the best that I possibly can. I'm not gonna take it lightly. I'm not gonna uh, not look at all the little nuances. Like I'm gonna be the best at that particular thing. When I come in here and I set up this podcast studio, you'll notice Right here, if you're watching the video, you can see these kit, these little screws right here. Yeah. Those really bother me <laughs> because they're actually in the screen on the video mm. and, I, and I can see them and yeah. they're bothering me because that's something that I could have probably just found a screwdriver and got those out of there. Like, it look I, a little bit better. And it would have yeah. just, dude, nobody's, that's not going to bother anybody except for me. Yeah. And that's enough. Like. So I, I look at all, I don't, I don't know, I feel like I'm rambling at this point, but I think you understand. Totally. Like, I want to be the best. If you don't mind me adding this idea, because when I think about guys in this conversation, I, I honestly think that most people think that it is their circumstance which determines if they can do their best today. Like if when, you know, you use the analogy of like, oh, when I think about my past and deflated or, you know, when I was trying to multitask or I think a lot of that time, those guys think because of their circumstance, they can't be the best. Right. They can't be happy. Sure. They can't be these things because their circumstances don't allow them to be. Right. And, and, I, and we talked about this in the main event, and I, I think we have this completely backwards, where we feel circumstances drive who you are as a man or who you choose to be uh, versus, uh, and it's be, do, have, right? Where we be that way. We do the necessary actions and then you have the results. Right. Then you're happy. Then you do these things. And it's not by circumstance. And right. in fact, let's be honest, look at all the men that you've interviewed on Tuesdays. Some of the most profound individuals, it wasn't their circumstance that made them no. amazing. 
It was who they chose to be in, in, spite, those circumstances. in spite of those circumstances. I look at um, one of my favorite m- scenes in a movie is In a Knight's Tale. Do you remember that? Yeah. I think it's called A Knight's Tale with Heath Ledger. Yeah. Yeah, where he's talking with his dad, and he's this little kid, and he's standing yeah. on this barrel or something. Yeah, yeah. Seeing the knights come by. watching the knights walk by. Yeah. And, and his dad's like something about changing the stars or whatever, and, and the guy next to him is like, you can't change the stars or whatever. And, and his dad's like, if you really want to, if you really want that to happen, then yes, you can change your stars, meaning you can change your quote-unquote fate. Yeah, you your have circumstances. Ul- your circumstances. Yeah. You have ultimate control over that. That little scene right there has stuck with me for so long, and I think it illustrates perfectly what you're talking about now is that your circumstances may be less than ideal. Yep. Okay. And decide to make the best of it. If you're, if you're sweeping floors at McDonald's and not putting that down and that's what you're doing right now, then be the best McDonald's floor sweeper that ever existed in the history of sweeping floors at yeah. McDonald's. And that communicated well with their fellow employees, lifted them up, made them love their jobs because you were there. Like right. It's far more than even just the sweeping. Of course. It's just you showing up. And Have how you ever you seen up? those guys who they're out on the road and this would be like the most miserable job ever to me. They're out on the road and they have these big signs and they're advertising for businesses. Oh yeah. And you know what I'm talking s- about? Spinning them and, around or and whatever. Some yeah. of them are like, <laughs> just standing like, this sucks. Hate my life. Hate my job. Yeah. And then you go a block and you'll see the guy and he's like flipping it around and like yeah. doing handstands. Doing ninja and like moves. Behind yeah. his back. <laughs> be that guy. Yeah. Don't be the bum who's sitting there feeling sorry for himself and wishing his life was different, be the guy who creates it, yeah. who's doing this. They're doing the same thing. Yeah. And one's getting, one's getting smiles and appreciation by people driving. The other one's like, oh, that poor yeah. sucker. He's yeah. changing his stars. <laughs> yeah. The other guy has resigned to his current life. Yeah. The guy who's flipping the sign is changing his stars. Yeah. That's great. All right. How are we doing here? <laughs> Good, take another man. one. Let's take yeah. one more you and then let's go. More? Let's go train. All right. Um... Yeah, Anthony LeConte, uh, firearm safety and training, maybe some recommendations around that space. Of- I'm not going to get into that right now. Um, I'm probably not the most qualified to give the best advice. <laughs> I have a, a limited experience in that, but I do have some podcast guests coming up on this very specific topic. Sweet. So stay, stay tuned there, Anthony. All right, Alex Selzman, what are your top tips for starting a business or a movement? Uh, again, man, we addressed this last week, I think. I, uh, I would say one thing we're going to do, and Kip, you and I talked about this last night. It must have been like 1 a.m. and I was half asleep, I think, at this point. But we're going to start scrubbing these a yeah. little bit so we're not like continuing to answer the same questions. So this is Alex. Yeah. Alex, go back and listen to last week's uh, podcast, Friday Field Notes specifically, because I talk about... I think I went through three specific strategies that you can use in your life uh, in order to grow a movement, rally people around a cause, co- uh, help yourself stand out in a crowded marketplace. I get very, very specific yeah. into that. And you, and this is Tribe Builder as well. Well, we do that. We do, we do have a course. Yeah. Uh, I don't have a, a timeline on that. Frankly, I do that when I feel like it, and yeah. I don't feel like it right now. <laughs> so go back and listen to that one. So here's, here's a great question I think to wrap up on. So Luke Watts. I find it easy to use failure or loss as a learning experience, but it is harder to use victories this way. What advice can you give about using victories as a way to move forward as well? You're going, uh, we're going to day after action review. Aren't you? <laughs> he, he says, you're going to go with a day, uh, the day after action review, aren't you? <laughs> it's what it is. You, you already know the answer. <laughs> it's, you, look, you said it's not hard to do it in loss. Why? Because you're reviewing it and you don't want to be miserable. That's why you're doing that. Yeah. You don't want to the lose. Loss, the loss motivates you to like yeah. step it up, right? So just take a win as, okay, well, I, I'm happy that I won, but it wasn't good enough. Or yeah. I, I could even do it better next time. So, so kind of frame it in the same thing. And then, like he says, do your after action review. Okay, we'll get, let's just take jujitsu again because we're here. Yeah. So let's say I submit somebody which doesn't happen all that often. That's your own part of the team. <laughs> but let's say I do, okay? I, I catch you in something, I submit you, and I feel good about that. If I just pat myself on the back and then go back to training, yeah, that was a wasted opportunity. Mm-hmm. I should be asking myself, okay, why did that work? Yeah. 
what is it that I did that I caught you or what were the little nuances that are easy to overlook or how, or how did I set that up? Or, yeah, how did I get right? into that position? Exactly. Yeah. Because then you start looking at that and breaking that down and then you can recreate it. The whole idea about anything is, rec- is to recreate the process. It, winning is not enough. Yeah. You need to know why you won so that you can do it the next time. Totally. Totally. It's not complicated. I think you just frame it the same as loss. I lost. I don't want to experience that again. So what can I do? Or on the other side of the spectrum, I won. I want to continue to experience that and I don't want to lose. So what can I do or what variables and factors went into yeah. the win that I can yeah. replicate next yeah, time. That was really hard to catch that. I barely got him or I used tons of energy getting into it. How do I make that more simplistic or how do I get into that weird position again? Because right. that was, I'm right. not even sure how we got there. Right. Yeah. Um, I would also say, ask people who maybe evaluated that or are further down the path. So last night I was rolling and I caught somebody in a submission and there was a brown belt watching. And so we, we were rolling and I felt good about it because I submitted the guy, right? Yeah. And so I went and had lunch or whatever, dinner, and then I came back and, and, and Sean came up and he's like, hey, can I give you a few pointers? Awesome. This is a perfect example of this. And I, yeah. I was like, yeah. You're, you're like, I don't need any I was like, pointer. What do you mean? I submitted the guy. Like, I was like, what do you mean? <laughs> but I, I was like, yeah, I would love that. He's like, hey, really good job here. He pointed out some things that, that I did well. And he's like, do this, tr- like, tr- just try this next time. And that will tighten up this choke or that, you know, he gave me, I'm not going to get into the specifics, but yeah. Um, Cause I don't want to give away any, yeah, secrets, yeah, any secrets to you, especially. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, so anyways, he gave me a few pointers and tightened up my game. I won, but I still, I, there's still something I to learn. tighten my game up. Yeah. Right. So that's a perfect example. All right. Should we wrap it up? Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, take sir. us home. Yeah. So guys, uh, as always, you can submit your questions, uh, one of two ways uh, by joining us in the Iron Council, our exclusive brotherhood to l- learn more about the IC, you can go to orderofman.com slash Iron Council, or of course our Facebook group, facebook.com slash group slash order of man. Um, I feel like we say this every time, but man, it's, this fight's important. It is important. Guys, That's why we're doing this. Share the message. I was talking to Dom actually earlier today. I love this. And he said, oh man, there's a, there's a few podcasts that he is fully aware of that he uses to introduce people. Oh, is that to oh, the you order, order of man, man podcast? Oh, that's yeah. Cool. So he's like, Oh, listen to this. I episode. need to know which ones those are. Yeah. You should ask. Him. I'll ask him. Yeah. But that's a great idea, right? Sure. It's like, Hey, you, 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 there's a one particular message that resonates with you. Copy that link. Sure. Share that with people. They don't need to subscribe to the podcast initially. Like let them listen to that episode. See if there's some interest there and, and share that message. Um, and then of course you can go to, to store.orderofman.com to, to get your guys to swag. And of course, like this hat. Yeah. And I both have these hats uh, and, I'm tucking, tuck and I'm not tucking and I'm not tucking my ears. I'm not. Did you see that guy who is like, <laughs> yeah, I think you are. Under uh, uh, maybe. Did you see that guy who's like, I don't trust a man that who has tucks his ears. ears and tucked into his yeah. hat. I'm like, well, yeah, just because you don't know who you're, t- <laughs> who you're talking to. Cause he would choke. Come to origin, right bro. Now. Yeah. I'll tuck your ears. Yeah. Say that to his face. Yeah. So, but you can follow Mr. Mickler on Instagram and Twitter at Ryan Mickler. Yes, sir. All right, guys. We'll let you get going. Again, also, too, if you're listening to this audio on iTunes or Stitcher or wherever you're doing the podcast thing, great. No problem. Oh, yeah. Make sure you check us out at YouTube because we've got the camera today. Uh, we're going to be doing a lot more video uh, for our podcast, not only these episodes, but also our interviews. So head to, I believe it's YouTube.com slash Order of Men. Check it out. Subscribe. And uh, you get to see our beautiful faces. Another great way to share as well. True. Yeah. Um, main event. Do you have those dates handy? Yeah. The dates are the 29th through the 31st of May, 2020. Uh, registration is open. It's only going to be open for a very short period of time because I don't think I told you this. We're like 40% sold out on the thing already. Awesome. Between alumni and Iron Council members. Yeah. So if you had to, again, orderofman.com slash main event, you can lock in your spot and you got plenty of time to do it yeah. not well i should say plenty of time to prepare for it you don't yeah. have a whole lot of time to get registered yeah we're gonna sell register now right. get your flights and everything that's later right. we got yeah. nine months before that's up cool all right guys go out there take action become the man you are meant to be